Right. Uh, fantastic. Whoops. Uh, right, we're going to start the uh, second phase of the presentations now. We've got four startup companies. Uh, I hope you enjoyed and were uh, impressed with some of the uh, presentations from the startups. Uh, we're going up the food chain now to the SMEs. Uh, so, with the first one is a company from Ireland, uh, Decawave, and uh, there's Kieran from Ireland here. Uh, and then we have three companies from, the, from Israel. Uh, so, uh, I will leave you in the confident hands of uh, Kieran. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Is um, Mr. Dr. Nagel here? Is he back? Has he left? He was on the judge er earlier on. Is he just walking in? Because that's uh, proof that Ireland is uh, one of the seven lost tribes of Israel. Nagel is a very Irish name. I was very amused to see that, right? <laughs> but, um, okay, so Decawave is an Irish company. It's a fabulous um, semiconductor company specializing in ultra-wideband. In fact, we're the world experts in it. We have a chip out. After spending five and a half million euros, which we got by basically breaking the legs of old ladies and 19-year-old boys, 50 grand a pop, to actually get that chip out, it allows you to locate anything to a precision of plus or minus 20 centimeters indoors, um, 45 meters non-line of sight, which means through walls, through obstructions, 45 meters, indoor line of sight, 150 meters, line of sight, 500 meters. So at 9-11, uh, when those firemen ran into the World Trade Center, they were lost via three fire trucks outside. You have located every single one of them as they move up to a speed of 18 kilometers per hour. You cannot locate, you cannot fit 11,000 uh, laptops in a 20 meter radius. We can locate 11,000 items in a 20 meter radius to plus or minus 10 centimeters. So if you have a mesh network, then you can locate an infinite number of objects indoors. This opens up a string of possibilities from um, location, which is beyond tracking, to association. Um, and I'll take you through that um, in a moment. So, um, we enable precision indoor location for RTLS, real-time location systems, and wireless sensor networks. And in fact, we will, act as a result of our technology, these two, these two markets will combine and explode. Um, and so you will, you will bring location capability to wireless sensor networks, and our chip will be able to actually make use of mesh networks. Um, existing use cases all demand precision, ultra-low cost, ultra-low power. No point bringing that level of performance if your tag costs 100 bucks, which they do now. Our chip for mobile phone applications will cost less than a buck. Runs off a single watch battery for greater than 10 years. Across many verticals, unique value proposition. We have 800 customers waiting for this part, a string of which are actually military. 20% of our revenue in 2015 will come from the safety and security uh, business. Um, and we have a chip in hand, as I've shown you. Okay, so where do we sit? <coughs> we fab our chips at TSMC. Um, we actually um, architect, um, design, bring to market. We have uh, 20 engineers in um, Dublin. We have an office in Toulouse, an office in Seoul, Korea. We've just opened up an office in uh, San Jose, California. Um, we sell to um, one of our leading um, 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 customers will be Lockheed Martin in the military and, uh, and defense space. We signed a deal with LG Inotech to bring a module to market using our chip. Aeroscout, an Israeli company, is one of the leaders for RTLS in the healthcare vertical they will use our chip for um, um, upgrading the precision. And then on to other people. Okay, so location-based services, right? Um, there are a string of ways you can do it. Um, um, outdoor technology, cellular, you can, you can locate somebody to plus or minus 100 meters, GPS plus or minus a meter, WiMAX plus or minus 100 meters. None of these work indoors. Once you go indoors, your options are Zigbee, ultrasound, Wi-Fi, and ultra-wideband. Ultra-wideband gets down to less than one meter. Our technology via standard gets down to less than 10 centimeters. And I was corrected when I gave a, a presentation in Munich by a Finnish company who actually bought our prototypes and they said, wrong, we get plus or minus five centimeters with your technology. Um, and these, um, everybody sort of says, well, well um, um, why do you need that sort of precision? The precision hasn't been available heretofore. Now that it's here, it's going to radically change everything. Um, Ireland, Irish people are known for being extremely politically incorrect. So I'll make a politically incorrect statement. The wife gets too close to the credit card, the credit card self-destructs. <laughs> so the, the um, actually in my case, that can be, if I get too close to the credit card, sorry. So it, it works through obstructions. Um, it's it's um, real-time location systems, uh, trilateration, multilateration is well understood. And you have to be able to, the most um, 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 accurate way is time difference of arrival. For time difference of arrival, you have to be able to detect the first signal. And for that, that can be a severely attenuated signal uh, particularly if it goes through obstructions and it's competing against other signals 
um, um, which have not necessarily been um, uh, um, attenuated. There's a fundamental law of physics which states that the um, precision with which something is located is inversely proportional to the bandwidth of the signal. 80211 Wi-Fi has a bandwidth of 20 megs, so you start off with 15 meters. There are people out there who say that you can get plus or minus 7 meters. That's if you pre-provision the building, right? Um, with our technology, which is based on uh, an IEEE standard 4A, bandwidth is 1,300 megahertz. You start off with 20 centimet 4 centimeters precision. You uh, very easily get that down to basically uh, plus or minus 10 centimeters and below. We have proven that to people like Intel, Cisco, Motorola, um, um, Aeroscout here, um, several other people. Okay, so let's imagine some of the actual um, um, use cases for it. Again, in the actual military, um, our, in the actual safety and security space, we're working with, with Lockheed, ITT, Raytheon, Talos, several other people. Um, the, the first example was 9-11, when those guys ran into the World Trade Center. They can be instantly located and associated. Another, um, um, Richard, where are you? Okay, things have changed since the 70s. Ireland and England are now very much at peace, but back then, when you we were, we were watching on actually TV, it was all stuck in my mind when the British soldiers were actually going through the um, areas in actually um, um, Belfast, you'd be ducking and diving between buildings. And the whole objective is to make sure that the terrorists cannot see you. If the terrorist sees you, you're dead. Um, but the problem of actually, of actually putting obstructions between you and the actual terrorists is that you're also putting obstructions between you and your colleagues. And so as a consequence, then actually communication is bad. So there'd be a posse of us here, eight soldiers going through some urban village, either in Northern, Telecom, uh, Northern Ireland, not anymore, Iraq, wherever, and we're each tagged and we're not allowed to be more than 100 metres away from each other because we've got 100 metres um, um, indoor line of sight, 45 metres non-line of sight operation. We'd each get a warning, okay, Richard, you're actually 70 metres away from your, from your nearest colleague. Either get out of there or guys move in his direction because Richard's... And so the corollary to location is being able to actually um, associate things and, um, um, and people. Um, the other big... Um, we spoke this morning about um, um, spin-in and spin-out opportunity I would argue that if the Global Security Challenge had been held in, uh, in the uh, 1900s, the winner would have been uh, Marconi, who was the inventor of the first ultra-wideband radio. If it doesn't have use in the consumer space, it doesn't have use in the military, as far as I'm concerned, or vice versa. Um, 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 LG are putting into electronic shelf labeling, and here, non-line of sight communication is key. These electronic shelf labels are everywhere in France, Japan, and Sweden right now. And you've got to be able to go through um, um, a significant number of objects for these price tags to be updated all the time. There are 200 million units sold so far. There will be 200 million units sold, sold in 2012. LG estimates that they will get 40% of the market share. They want our technology because of its precision, its power consumption, and, uh, and the actual price. Hospitals. Um, I'm a doctor. John, I'm in your space. I'm associated with you. I'm actually uh, one meter away from you, so you're going to get filled for my time. I go over then to... Ella, Ella, and I'm in um, Ella's space. Ella is now associated with me. He's going to get billed for my time. Uh, the whole thing in the actual the um, uh, real-time location systems in hospitals is a five-year existing market, but they've got it down to room precision, and it's not enough. I'm looking for a bag of blood. Is it on this side of the wall or that side of the wall? Um, again, um, um, people like Aeroscout, Radar Find, all of the leaders are, are going to be switching to our um, chip. Um, warehousing and logistics, Savvy is, is going to be using our technology. Try finding something there. And actually, with our technology, the guy comes in with a forklift truck, where do I put it? Put it anywhere you want, because we'd be able to locate it um, to, to plus or minus 10 centimeters through, the, through that form of um, obstructions. Um, when I presented this first to actually Lockheed Martin, the guy in Lockheed Martin said, uh, that looks like my organization. <laughs> but, so this is um, um, a pig. Each time a pig goes to a trough, he eats, um, and he's RFID tagged at the moment. Everything's, everything's fine. The problem is when the pig is sick. And they have to go into the sea of pigs and find out where that pig is. And that's why they want to be able to add real-time location systems capability to, um, 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 to each pig, so long as it is, as is, as it is dirt cheap. Our, chi our chip is 7 square millimeters and 19 nanometers TSMC, which anybody knows will basically uh, fully tested, fully packaged price to us is a buck. If we were a large company, it would be 50 cents. So in volume, we will be down to a buck uh, per chip. And that's all it needs, that and an antenna. Um, which we have as well. Factory automation, Boeing are, are, um, are big users um, of RTLS. Wireless LAN access points, both Cisco and Motorola states that they will upgrade the wireless LAN access points once TDOA-based systems based on ultra-wideband are there in chip form, which we are there. Why do they insist on it being TDOA and why do they insist on it being, being ultra-wideband? So it's to deal with the, um, um, 
reflections which, uh, if you have a narrowband system like actually Wi-Fi, basically cancel destructively or interfere destructively. We have almost, um, uh, we have extremely high immunity to what's known as multipart fading by virtue of the fact that, that the pulses are really narrow. Um, the chip itself is called sensor. Um, the, the, the master of the chip, basically, uh, uh, the CTO, Michael, who I went to university with, is a crossword nut. It stands for Seek, Control, Execute, Network. That's the stand. The tag is a SOAR. Senses obeys, responds. Hence, the chip is a sensor. It can be configured as either a SEN or a SOAR. Um, we know that it's 20 times smaller than anybody else. A uh, very, very, very large Asian company um, 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 commissioned the Bell Labs of Asia, who you should know who, who actually that is, to actually do a uh, chip version of it, and it came out 20 times um, um, bigger, hence 20 times the price, 20 times the cost. Uh, 50 times lower power than basically 15.4, which is in chips, and 30 times less power in receive, which is unprecedented for ultra wideband. Normally, it's basically 100 times higher power. Um, locate items to plus or minus 10 centimeters of where they are located. Line of sight 500 meters, non line of sight 45, indoor line of sight, which is if you picture the atrium in um, the Hyatt in, in, in any of the, the, the hotels in the States. 11,000 items within a 20 meter range, uh, radius, two way ranging capability, which means it doesn't need a network. So um, I have it on my, uh, my mobile phone, Richard, you have it on your mobile phone, I know exactly where you are on a sphere. Your wife has it on her mobile phone, we have you down to, down to, down to two spots. So you could actually have your kids tagged as you go into a um, uh, supermarket, and he's actually programmed not to be, John, I don't want to be any more than 70 meters away from me, you get an, uh, an alert on your mobile phone once that happens. Uh, very high immunity to multipart fading, and it's a um, um, fully, fully compliant to the actual standard. So why ultra-wideband? Why 4A, which is the standard? Why a coherent receiver? Why a DecoWave chip? Why ultra-wideband? Because it's ultra-wideband at a very high data rate, we like to say, if you've got some, something to say, say it real quick and then shut up. Get off the air after that. And that's how you conserve power. Uh, it has an extremely low transmit power. Very high uh, immunity to multipart fading, near zero coexistence issues with Wi-Fi, Zigbee, etc., and, and um, coexistence is becoming a real problem at 2.4 gigahertz. Um, why 802.15.4a? The standard was ratified in Q1 2007. We were involved in it since 2004. We've got um, a string of essential patents which we're licensing almost for free under the actual RAND terms, and we've got implementation patents. Because it is basically 802.15.4a, it has what's known as an IPATOF preamble sequence, which is a perfect periodic autocorrelation function. That means that each, each message it's sent, you, you know exactly what the channel is like, and that allows you to actually de detect that first signal. Um, because it's 802.15.4a, it can be de detected by a, a coherent or a non-coherent receiver. Non-coherent receiver is basically an uh, energy detection circuit. You want to do it coherently. Very few people know how to do it the way we know how to do it. It can use two-way ranging or time of flight, time difference of arrival. So why coherent receiver? Um, because our chip is a fully coherent receiver, that's how you get the extremely long line of sight and non-line of sight range. And that's why you get 10 centimeter precision. But why use our chip? Because we know how to implement a fully coherent receiver in 7 square millimeters, 19 nanometers TSMC. Hence, it's dirt cheap and really low um, receive power. We have um, um, 800... Um, Companies waiting for the parts. The founder of Cambridge Silicon Radio is coming onto the board. That's the chip. We need to win this uh, award because I need to take it into production. Uh, we've got enough money to get until the end of Q1 next year. Uh, very few people fund the chip companies, very few. And in fact, um, I've done an awful lot of work in Israel. The founder of Power Design told me, uh, you'll only get your money in Ireland, Kieran, as, as a startup company. And there's no money in Ireland. Thank you. Well, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if Kieran's going to win the competition, but he wins the competition for cramming the most amount of words in uh, <laughs> 10 minutes. Uh, the next uh, company is EBIT Security System, if you'd care to come up, please. Whereabouts are you, if you see it? Yeah. You did load it up, didn't you? No. Try another directory. Maybe. It's in the original directory. Yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, Heading desktop? Is that IAI? Oh, it could be. Let's go mm. to desktop. Uh, let see desktop. This one? Mm. Do that one? Mm. This one. That one? Yeah. 
that you? Got it. <clears throat> and you can abuse okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, I'm Yossi Chaimovic, the CTO of Elbit Security Systems. <coughs> Elbit Security Systems is a uh, subsidiary of Elbit Systems uh, doing Homeland Security. Uh, we are involved in uh, several areas of uh, security, uh, such airport security, uh, border control, uh, safe city, transportation uh, security, etc. <clears throat> several examples of what we are doing, airport security, securing all the uh, outbound of the airport, using uh, electronic fences, uh, electro-optics, uh, command and control, um, critical sites. It's better now? Okay. Uh, coastal surveillance, uh, <coughs> laying along the coast uh, observation systems integrated together with radars, of course, command and control to have a uh, situation awareness picture. Uh, border security, um, deploying along the borders um, several uh, systems like electronic fences, electro optics, um, etc. Uh, safe city, the same technologies. Uh, oil and gas uh, industry, um, here we have uh, the refineries with uh, the regular security system, uh, uh, solutions. On the other hand, we have uh, the challenge of long pipes, how to secure them. And here is one of the examples of the relevant uh, system that we are going to present. This is the fiber optic security system, uh, the FOSS, that is based on the technology known as the fiber broad ratings. Um, the system actually is a long fiber that is an acoustic sensor that you can uh, bury it into the ground. And here is an example of an airport uh, security application where you can use the fiber to uh, put it into the ground along the, along the airport and uh, to have the ability to uh, protect it. Uh, it has uh, an interrogator that is actually a transceiver, a laser, a coherent laser transceiver and uh, a platform to analyze the signal, the incoming signal. Another application is, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is to pro how can you protect long lines of uh, gas and oil pipes. Uh, the fiber is a very good solution since it's a passive uh, device. You can have it stretched to many kilometers, uh, and the infrastructure is uh, relatively cheap, no need for power. Uh, it's based on sensing interference signals via light phase changes between the uh, gratings. Uh, it provides continuous coverage of ladders with passive device, as I mentioned, no need for uh, infrastructure, no need for power, of course, as any uh, Homeland Security application, it works 24-7. Since it's fiber and it's passive, it's immune to EMI RFI, and it's hard <coughs> to detect, and it's uh, temper-proof. How it works. <coughs> Bra rating is actually to take a fiber and to modify the internal refraction index locally. By that, you can get reflections of a laser to specific <coughs> wavelengths. It's like a local mirror, and you can play with the reflections to have more reflections or uh, less reflections to a specific uh, wavelengths. I try to animate the concept. If we have an interference, if this is the interference, it creates acoustical noise in the ground. And if we have the fiber in the soil, uh, we have the fiber with the gratings. And uh, each uh, segment between two gratings is actually one sensor, acoustical sensor. The, we have laser injected into the fiber. <coughs> and each grating creates reflections for this uh, for the incoming laser. By the acoustic noise, what we create is interference of, uh, of the uh, optical lengths, and then we modulate, modulate the phase shift of the incoming signals 
By that we get the interference uh, received by interrogator and then analyzed by the signal processor. So we get the acoustic noise received by the system and then we apply our algorithms to analyze the incoming signal so we can detect if there is an interference. We can also identify, uh, potentially identify the nature of the interference so we can classify the in uh, interference. <clears throat> this was an example of a simple uh, uh, wavelength. Unfortunately, it is limited in the range. You cannot go far enough with one wavelength, so we have a, another a more sophisticated approach where we use a combination of multi-wavelengths where we use several wavelengths in order to get uh, large distances to do it uh, more practical. And this is a combination of uh, TDM and WDM technology, meaning using several wavelengths in the same system, in the same fiber. Uh, the fiber gets to be a little bit more complicated. It means uh, dealing with uh, several wavelengths. And you see here, for example, five groups for each wavelength, and by that we can cover large distances, let's say 25 kilometers for one interrogator. By that we get it uh, more economical, of course. Uh, our markets, as I started, is actually the same markets that we are already in, but what we introduce here is a new technology, a new system that uh, will provide some benefits in terms of performance, cost benefits, etc. We are talking about the gas and oil industry, as I already mentioned, uh, transportation, transportation, secure railways, uh, critical sites, and border protection. Thank you. Our next one is escape rescue systems. Uh, we, let's get that out. It's a daisy. Yeah, is that no? All right, I'll leave you two. You know which one. They're down here. Here we go. That's it. And straight up and down. Here. Uh, st still good morning. Uh, my name is Yanni Shimshani, um, CEO and founder, or one of the founders of Escape Rescue Systems. Uh, you all need to brace for some serious low-tech after having seen a morning of uh, high-tech, but I hope you'll find it uh, fascinating, interesting, and important uh, nonetheless. Uh, Mark Twain was uh, once asked by a young person what he should invest in, and reportedly Mark Twain responded, buy land, they don't make it anymore. <laughs> and it turns out that uh, he was right. And one of the, one of the uh, outcomes of the fact that they don't make land anymore is that the human race has begun reaching for the skies, and we now live um, in in towers more uh, taller and taller and more and more. And at the moment, there are millions of people working and, um, and living in very tall towers around the world with a growth rate of about 2 to 4%, uh, depending on who you ask, um, in that. And the fact that we live in these towers or work in these towers creates tremendous opportunity for bad things to happen, both natural and man-made, and creates for us tremendous challenges in um, trying to make sure that the people who live and work in these towers uh, come, out of come out alive of these unfortunate events. When we think about getting uh, either responders in or people out of, uh, of tall buildings, um, we realize very quickly that it's, it's a major challenge. If you think of the geometry of these buildings, you see, you see the challenge immediately. But in any case, um, if you try to get in from the outside, you're limited to about 10 stories, which is what firemen ladders know how to do. And if you try to use the inside, you very quickly reach um, populations just simply uh, can't negotiate going up and down um, tall buildings, either sick people, disabled people, people in beds, uh, people with asthma, pregnant women, uh, very, very large populations. Um, most analysts think it's about 10 to 15 percent of the residents of any given building simply can't do it. Regular elevators, we've all seen the signs, don't use me in fire. 
And just when you need the uh, SWAT teams or the fire teams or the police teams up on the 35th floor, it takes them about 35 to 50 minutes to get up there at the moment you need them. When the International Standards Organization addressed uh, this, this issue back in 2004, what they concluded was that we should probably not design buildings to withstand tremendous impacts uh, of small probabilities, but we, when they asked the question uh, to themselves, they said we should design routes and methods of getting people out of buildings which have experienced a catastrophic event. They said, of course, we should do that. Okay, this is the wrong version, but I'll, I'll use this uh, version anyway. Um, company history, just a few words. We were actually, we had the idea in 2002, and the, um, the driving idea was very simple. Instead of going down and then out, let's go out and then down. That was the driving um, idea. We managed to get a uh, prototype up in Israel in 2004, and then we very naively went barreling off to the United States to see if we could, it seemed like the most natural market for us. And so we went there in 2004, 2005, and we were basically, uh, we basically slipped, did not succeed in the United States, and we can talk about that um, uh, briefly. Basically what the market in America told us and in some other countries was get yourselves regulated. You want to put tens and maybe hundreds of people on devices and get them out of buildings. Get yourselves much more regulated and get yourselves uh, a much cheaper solution. So we came back uh, to Israel and uh, regrouped, uh, redefined what we were doing, uh, re-strategized, uh, refinanced, um, and we'll talk uh, uh, briefly uh, what that was all about. But we finally, in 2010, have our first commercial agreements uh, for sale, and actually the first project is beginning uh, in Israel as we speak. And now, so, uh, so you can enjoy a bit of, um, of action and drama, here is what our thinking created. That was not animation, it wasn't Photoshop. That's a real system, uh, probably a few kilometers from here, uh, in Ahmed Gun. It actually works. The driving principles. When we came to design the system, we had the, we had the, um, we had the fortunate fact that none of us was from this area of activity. So nobody came with any preconceived ideas. So we first defined some, some principles. Uh, the first principle was that any evacuation solution had to work up as well as down, had to get responders in and not just people out. It had to be democratic. It had to work as well for an 85-year-old person as for a 22-year-old marathon runner. It had to be completely intuitive in use. It couldn't demand any kinds of activities that you weren't used to doing in your everyday life. It had to be mass evacuation, and we actually have two solutions. The one that you saw in the film uh, can evacuate 135 to 150 people per cycle, and we have developed a uh, lighter system. I mentioned some of the feedback we got. So we have a light system, um, which evacuates about 30 people uh, per cycle. Um, when the market told us, give us a better return on investment, we went back and said, okay, how can we make the system useful every day, not just never, because hopefully never 
will it be used or will it be required? And we have now developed a logistic use for it. And you can see the logistic cabin there in red. And you can actually use it every day if you need to replace a cooler on the roof or uh, grandma's piano needs replacing on the 17th floor. You can use it for that as well. The payloads are quite large um, and it can be quite useful. And of course, it had to be energy independent uh, because one of the first things that goes in an emergency in a building is its power. So. The light system, uh, which I will not show you in action, but you can see up here on the, uh, in the slides, is basically two cabins. Uh, the moment it's two cabins and not five, you don't need to have them fold. Folding, by the way, is very complicated. To have something that folds, and, and then when it's open, to have it completely fire and smoke proof. That turns out to be a real challenge. But if you have only two cabins, you can make the nest one inside the other. One's a bit bigger than the other, and they simply, this is the way it's stored, come across the building. Unnest, uh, unnest for use. Um, uh, in that way, uh, that was that was one mechanism for driving down uh, the costs. Uh, when the market said, "Go get yourselves regulated," we went to get ourselves regulated, and no, I think we did we did that actually in a big way. Up on the left, um, top left, we went to the Department of Homeland Security and said, "Would you designate us as a qualified anti-terrorism technology?" Um, they studied us for about uh, eight or nine months, and the result was, yes, we were designated under the Safety Act uh, as a qualified anti-terrorism technology. We then said, okay, we need a standard, some kind of standard to govern the, the system, and we discovered there was no standard anywhere in the world uh, to, to govern this kind of, um, of manufacturing and deployment, so we convinced ASTM, which is the leading standards organization in America and in the world for building performance, to set up a standards committee for uh, external evacuation devices, uh, and in 2007 we had a standard published um, that, that governs us. Then we then went to the National Fire Protection Association and asked them would they recognize the system, and they studied it for much longer, for about three years, and in 2009 recognized the solution on condition that, it, that any such solution meets the ASTM standard, and you can see we were very happy. They actually used a photo of, of our system in their, um, in their handbook, but that's, that, that just happened. We then went to Aon, probably the, the world's leading uh, insurance brokerage, and we asked their real estate division to simply study the solution and give their assessment of what would be the impact, if any, on premiums, um, in insurance premiums in the future. And they studied it, and their response was that we believe that this reduction in risk could potentially result in substantial reductions in the insurance costs, both for property and casualty, or property and life. Uh, so uh, we were then set to go back into the market. We see two, two different approaches to the market, or two ways of looking at the market. The first is the general high-rise sector, um, which is an interesting sector. As I said, it's growing very fast. And just in the, in the 10 leading or 10 largest cities, there are 38,000 uh, high-rise buildings. We have discovered there are particular advantages in, in emerging markets where there's a lot of construction going on. The standards are not as well developed. The construction standards are not as well developed uh, as in some of the developed countries. Uh, and the security services uh, are uh, not bashful to um, security and fire ser services are not bashful in, um, in fessing up to the fact that they don't have good responses themselves and are happy to see other responses. But we also see uh, a lot of continued interest from, the, from developed countries at the moment, actually from the UK, um, with, a spe with special focus on existing stock, where the building standards were uh, not as well developed. Uh, a lot of the, I, I don't know what the opposite of outreach is, in reach, a lot of the, re the, the reaching out to us uh, from around the world um, has actually been uh, from what we call mobility impaired buildings. And these can be hospitals, homes for the elderly, um, institutions for the disabled. This is an, en an enormous sector. Uh, and in Israel alone, there are 34 hospitals and there are 450 homes uh, for the elderly. And in the United States, there are 11,000 hospitals. These are just examples. So it's, so it's a very large sector. Um, what, what people have started to discover, once, once they see the solution and they start thinking about it, they say, actually, we don't have a problem from the 25th floor. Our problem begins at the second floor. We don't know how to get a person in a, in, a, in a hospital bed or a wheelchair out from the second floor, the third floor, the fourth floor. Forget the 29th floor. Um, so this has become something for us to focus on. 
And what we are doing now, the slide says finalize and execute first scale project. Actually, the, the uh, project has been finalized in the sense that it's signed and, and off and running uh, at the main medical center in, in Tel Aviv. Um, we are now beginning to and are, and, and are in the process of expanding approval, regulatory buy-in in this sector and abroad. Actually, the project at, at the medical center has, to, has become a Ministry of Health project, not a particular hospital project. And their intention is to take it on to other hospitals if this first project is successful. Um, and we are trying at the same time uh, to develop our, at least one first foreign market uh, in a big way. It will probably, probably be India. Um, but that's, that's the way things look now. In terms of um, sales, it's, this is not a forecast. It doesn't say forecast. It's a scenario. Um, once you've been on the road for seven years, you sort of don't forecast anymore. But uh, and may, maybe you do uh, develop scenarios. Uh, we think that just in the light system, which is what's up here, not in the standard system, we should be able to reach about $15 million, $15 million of sales uh, by, by 2014 and probably double that through sales of, um, of the standard system. The last thing I want to show you um, is... We wanted to see uh, what, what kind of application this had outside of fire and that kind of emergency. And uh, we asked um, a reserve uh, anti-terror team from the Israeli anti-terror forces to come and do an exercise in our building uh, using this. And we, uh, it turned out to be a great exercise, so we filmed it. Um, of course, we'll show you the very condensed version, not using the technology we saw earlier. But we'll show you like the, the, the one and a half minute version of, um, of this exercise. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. And now our last but not least, uh, Safe End Limited. Today, you've heard about water, air, land. Uh, going to talk a bit about cyber. That's a new command both for the US and for Israel recently. Uh, SafeEnd, we're a six year old company uh, based in Israel doing endpoint security. And I'm here to talk about a new product we're doing specifically for detection of leakage and prevention of advanced persistent threats. And I'll talk about what advanced persistent threats are. Uh, we're 65 people based in Israel. Uh, we've been selling for almost five years now. 22, over 2,200 customers, 2.6 million seats installed as of beginning of last quarter. We're beyond that already. Uh, and those are some of our government customers. Uh, we're looking at those government customers and definitely looking at this challenge here as a way of introducing our new product into this specific market 
and being able to help people that today have a very hard time detecting an advanced persistent threat entering their systems. So this is our current offering. We have protector that can protect against USB devices that are used to either introduce or take out stuff from your network. We have encryptor that encrypts data and makes sure that when you lose a device or a hard drive or a PC, there is no problem. And the offering that is most relevant to uh, CyberGuard is Inspector. Inspector does content-based DLP. We're looking at every single piece of text inside those files and deciding whether it's sensitive or not. And we're doing this for commercial purposes, for people who want to make sure they're not losing their IP, they're not sending out sensitive data to the places where they shouldn't. And we're based on something we call content-aware application control. We can look at every single application on every single PC you're running and make sure whether it should or shouldn't access data. And that means we can do something we call CyberGuard. CyberGuard will be able to tell who the user, what the application, what the machine, where it's going, and be able to very, very quickly take care of something like that. When you're looking at the stories about attacks, whether it's Iran or whether it's the Pentagon, the attack would take sometimes three, four, or five months before people actually realize there's something inside your network and something is leaving your network. Somebody is changing your files in a way that is dangerous. And we've obviously been getting a lot of press lately with regards to that. What this means is basically if you're looking at the tools that we have today, today you're collecting from all parts of the network a lot of information about something that could be a cyber threat, something that is trying to access your data and exfiltrate it, something that is trying to access your data and possibly change it, affect it. You are collecting all this data from multiple sources and none of the sources has all the data in one place. That means that you have to go through thousands or tens of thousands of events, correlate them using AI techniques, and there are a lot of players in the market that are doing amazing stuff with correlating stuff from many different sources to be able to get a picture. In our case, because we have the content of our application control, at the place where data is generated, at the very origin of being able to access the data and change it, we can get all the information. We get the machine, we get the user, we get the user in the process, not just the real user who is logged in, but the actual user who is running the application, we get all the content, so we can tell somebody is trying to insert something into your finance files, into your process operation files. And all of this in a single log entry. This means that the time to breach and the network damage that can be done is significantly shorter, significantly lower than what can be done with any other technology out there today. So what we're looking to do is, first of all, provide instant accurate forensic data. Our initial value would not even be blocking those advanced persistent threats. There's lots of technologies on the market doing anti-malware, antivirus, intrusion prevention systems, many different flavors of trying to stop the threat. We're not doing that yet. What we're doing already is providing instant and accurate forensic data to identify those threats. And if you have that system inside your network, like people had our USB control system, they couldn't be hurt by those type of attacks in the first place. But somebody would have this kind of system in their network would be able to very quickly tell that something is inside his network trying to ch touch a specific sensitive file without it being detected by anybody else. The transfer log and each and every entry is equivalent today 
to multiple thousands lines of logs from firewalls, from AV systems, from many other security systems around. So, why are we here? What are we going to do with the money? First of all, there's always more improvement to do in the accuracy. Uh, this is a cat and mouse game against attackers, and once we're out there, people will start attacking us, trying to find ways around what we're doing. We want to improve detection accuracy, we want to add additional layers to our system so that we can go from the detection that we're doing today all the way to being able to be sensitive enough and accurate enough to actually do blocking, to be able to say, okay, this application did something wrong, and we're not only telling you as a security administrator that you need to take a look at that machine and take a better look at that specific application, but we're actually blocking that application completely from running, from accessing any data. This is one type. The other direction, the false positive direction, is making sure that no other thing that is running in there in unusual ways triggers that machine, and that would require additional research, additional work with actual customers as well. Uh, additional uh, improvements would be, obviously, with field testing, and we are looking here uh, for finding a partner that would allow us to test the system live. We have right now joint activity with one large U.S. civilian agency, but obviously uh, the military and the defense community as a whole can take us a lot farther, a lot quicker than what uh, even a large civilian defense, civilian agency can take us. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the presentations. Uh, there is a panel discussion starting uh, in a few moments. But could I ask all the finalists and my judges to uh, follow me uh, outside to the uh, Q&A room where the, all the presentations will have 10 minutes in private with the judges. And then after your panel discussion, we will come back and announce the winners. Thank you.